Hey everybody, welcome to today's, today's chat. So I want today, you know, to start kind of a, a new series that I'm going to try and do. And for the next few weeks or maybe longer, um, you know, I don't know how long this is going to take us to do. We are going to try and design a game together, hopefully. And what I want is for you guys to see sort of the process that goes into making a game and designing a game and, and where I kind of go from start to finish. So, um, anyways, I hope everybody's having a great week. Hopefully, um, everything here, we're, we're, where I'm living, we're having a big storm that's just hitting. So, hopefully, my power and internet and everything <laughs> stay good. We're, we're about to get slammed, I've heard. So, um, but hi, Tony, and hi, Big Lob. Yeah, I'm feeling a little bit better. I'm still still a little bit um, shaky today, but um, kind of roller coaster for my health lately. So, um, anyways, um, hopefully everybody can see the this document um, okay in in the view. I'll try to keep it as zoomed up as I can um, for everybody to kind of see. Um, it's not the most convenient to work. Um, with it so big, so we'll, we'll have to be, kind of be doing a lot of um, scrolling around a lot today. Um, so bear with me as we kind of um, try to work on this together. Hey, Jonathan, thanks for joining. And so again, you know, I want um, this this talk and this conversation to be interactive. Um, so I hope that you guys will give me ideas and brainstorm and really um, again the the goal of today and these next weeks or months I'm not sure um, is going to be to try to kind of show you how I go from zero to sort of nothing you know and with the the concept of being um, trying to create a pitch deck or you know a game design document or something like that for a game and you know kind of trying to see where where is that going to go where is that going to take us i don't know um you know and so this is going to be a little bit of diving into the the to my brain and kind of my process the best i can and so you'll have to kind of bear with me as we may run in circles um, we may backtrack a little bit we may go down some rabbit holes and and chase some ideas that suck you know and um but I think it's it's a good exercise, um, whether you're one of my students or whether you're new to game design or whatever, um, to kind of just see how you put together an idea from just nothing, you know, into into something. And and this ideation part of it is really challenging for a lot of people. You know, it, it's something that that seems like it's kind of easy. You know, this idea of coming up with a new game idea. Um, from scratch is um, something that I think Jonathan and, and some of my other students that are with us today can attest is um, quite often just, you know, you feel like, hey, I've played a thousand games. How hard could it be to come up with a new idea, right? And in the end, the the ideation, you know, and creating that idea is significantly harder than, than you realize. And, you know, it's really easy to think like, oh, well, I'll build this, right? And you start to build it and you're like, oh, wait, that's not fun. And then, and then you, you backtrack a little bit and you kind of go in another direction, you know, and, and sometimes you you start over altogether. Um, sometimes, you know, you um, 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 will, you know, try different ideas, try different genres, try different, you know, things that, that could be really big in, in scope and scale or not. So, um. You know, today, you know, and for this topic, we are going to kind of, I guess, shortcut for me some of the ideation process. Um, some of the ideation process for me would include um, a lot more game playing um, and trying to understand the competition um, or what I, what I think might be competition a lot more. Um, it could include, um, especially for me, watching a lot more YouTube videos um, where, you know, I'll quite often kind of get an idea for something that I want to do and then I'll watch um, you know and look for videos that might be overview videos of like a particular game genre or you know like a top 10 video of like you know top 10 RPGs of you know 
of this year or next year or top 10 upcoming RPGs. And, you know, and I'll use that to sort of look for ideas, right? And to, to kind of brainstorm ideas. So first of all, is we're kind of getting started. I know there's not a lot of people on yet. Um, I want to just know, like, do, do any of you guys have ideas for where we want to go or where you'd like us to, to go or ideas for games? That could be a, a particular genre of game. It could be, you know, whether that's a RPG or a first person shooter, um, that could be science fiction or fantasy, um, or just any kind of ideas. And so, um, so please this, again, this, this talk today and during this conversation is a, um, um, is an open conversation, right? Not that I can make everybody happy, but there right now there, there is literally no ideas like Northbound, um, Big Lob, I mean, yeah, I was, I was thinking, you know, I, I literally have honestly spent maybe five or 10 minutes at most thinking about this. I have not really thought through this at all. I kind of purposely wanted to go in a little bit cold and, um, and sort of a little bit lost and confused. Um, and so, um, I'm trying to, I want to create something AAA. And so let's just, you know, in our, in our requirements, you know, here I want to I want to say that AAA, you know, at least in in quality, right? So our our perception is going to be this is a kind of a big idea. This would be something that if I was at EA or Ubisoft or a big studio that we would produce, um, you know, with a decent budget, um, you know, um, and um, team size. So it doesn't mean that this has to be, you know. Um, Thousands of people, you know, but, but, but let's just assume that there's not a lot of limits, you know, to this, you know, right now. And, um, yeah, so I was thinking, you know, something maybe sci-fi, um, one of my just back the napkin sort of ideas today was also maybe something superheroes. Um, and maybe that's a sci-fi superhero game, right? Um, and, um, so I think that, you know, part part of this discussion, you know, about when we have a blank slate, when we have something that we don't know what it is, um, we also want to sort of understand, like, what do other people like? I mean, there, there's part of what, what, you know, understanding what we like and what we want, right? And that that is important because you want to build something you're passionate about. You want to build something it, when possible, right? I mean, we're, we're not always given that choice. But when we have the time, we want to try to do something that is interesting to us. We want to try to do something that, that we enjoy because we will do a much better job um, with that when, you know, when it's something we're, we're really passionate about, right? And so, um, so when we're brainstorming here, um, the, the important thing is that there's no wrong ideas, right? And so please don't be shy. Don't feel bad. Um, I will, you know come down on anybody if you if you say somebody's got a bad idea or if you whatever you know this is not a you know this is a this is I want to be a safe space right this is a safe place now that doesn't mean that the ideas will fit with what we're trying to do but please understand that that all ideas right now when we're brainstorming are good ideas right and there, there's no such thing as a bad idea and that's an important thing to foster for yourself um, and even just being kind to yourself sometimes of like Cause there's times even for myself where I'll come up with an idea and I'm like, God, I'm an idiot. Like that was stupid. You know, and I kind of beat myself up for, for thinking of something that I kind of realized later was, was dumb, you know, and that's, but right now, you know, whether it is with yourself or you're, you're building a team, you know, and you're working with a team, you want to make sure that the, the ideation process, the brainstorming process is safe. Right. You know, and if you guys don't understand that, you know, meaning that there's no right, right or wrongs, right? There, there is things you might do or may not do for various reasons. And it doesn't mean that you have to discuss every idea, right? But, but you want people to be able to throw out really crazy, wacky stuff. And you're like, whoa, okay, that's kind of cool. But like, let's rein it in a little bit. Let's try to make something that, that fits and comes up with, you know, the core of the game. And, and so for the sake of this particular, um, Thing. I want to I want to sort of make it that it's that it's um, um, 
I want to say, um, um, bear with me here. I don't want typos. So, um, so this is kind of the, um, so you'll hear me talking about this a lot, you know, with this kind of, if you're in my class or in my other talks about this kind of 80-20 rule. So what that sort of means is that there, there's a certain amount of the project is um, is kind of known, you know, meaning that, that it follows a genre conventions or it has something sort of there. And then certain part of the project is new and original, right? And I think it's important, at least for today, because we are we are attempting to teach everybody today about how to do a process, right? And so we can go down and try to create someday, another time, a project that is completely and totally 100% unique and weird and strange and you know innovative and all these things, right? But that kind of game design is really, really, really hard to do. And, and I think for the sake of this is, this is a idea, this is a class, this is about teaching people the basics. And so I don't want us to get too far down a road of just like something um, too crazy. So for, for example, Northbound, you mentioned Inception. Um, don't get me wrong, I love Inception um, and those types of movies, um, but when they're too crazy, and they're, and they're too much, then we have to be careful, right? And and if it's something that just like totally warps our brains and, and has to be something that's that's really crazy. Now, now maybe the story can be kind of that. Maybe the story can be something sort of original. Um, but, you know, the... Um, but maybe the... Um, the gameplay and the game mechanics and stuff are a little bit more defined and a little bit more, you know... Um, known there, right? So, so let us try to kind of use that 80-20 rule and that we're not going to go too far. Another thing real quick I want to define here is that um, we're going to say this is PC console. And, um, and you know, let's just for now say it's premium, meaning we're not going to, um, not, not going to do free to play for now, right? That, that simplifies um, things. So it's, this is more of a retail product right and that simplifies a lot of our design choices and monetization strategies and and things like that um you know to go with and then um you know let's just say um you know is kind of i'm guessing sort of here but you know doesn't mean that this isn't a applicable to younger or older kids but i just want to make it clear we're not doing a kit we're not doing a kids game um or something like that, right? So, so I just want us to sort of all be um, um, there. And um, Jonathan, to, to answer your question, um, emergence of a broad category. Um, let, let's let's discuss maybe some areas of emergent gameplay. Um, we can discuss maybe doing open world, um, but let's just say. Um, We'll say try and avoid, you know, um, open world. Um, and let's do this for now. Let's just focus on single player only as well. So what we're doing there is setting some artificial limits. These may not be, you know, um, realistic. Now, this doesn't mean that later on we don't do multiplayer or something like that. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to set some artificial limits on scope, scale, and complexity that will allow us to focus our design choices a little bit more. Um, so emergent gameplay, I think is cool. And I think it can be um, within the scope of this, um, but where that can get into that dangerous um, fine line there, I think is when it gets into open world gameplay and open world games are usually almost fully emergent. So let's try to find that as far as, you know, a game that's, that's a little bit more, um, I want to say, like, if you think of a game like Thief or something like that, right, where they, they were, um, or Deus Ex, Deus Ex, um, I would say that those have really great emergent gameplay things and many ways to play, but they weren't set in, like, fully open world, you know, like Far Cry 
kind of universes, right? And so, so I'm okay exploring emergence and emergent gameplay. I just want to try to avoid open world. And, and if, for those of you that are kind of new to game design or whatever, open worlds um, to me are, you know, and I've designed a number of them. Um, they're five, ten times harder to design because controlling the player just becomes so much harder in the world and how you're trying to design it. And so they, they feel like they're a lot of fun, you know, and they feel like they're, they're, they're fun to design, but you, you get a lot of big rabbit holes there that you have to try to solve. Um, especially, you know, even, you know, games where you, especially in open world games where you can fly and stuff like that, you, you can get into a lot of bad problems pretty quickly. Um, and, and those become really, really, really challenging to design. And so, so I don't want to, again, go too complex here. You know, I don't want to get into building MMORPGs and, you know, things like that. Right. Um, so let's, let's think about that, um, before we get started. Um, and, um, so yeah, let me, um, so give me one second here. I want to, um, address, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I, I truly appreciate all the the northbound, especially, and Jonathan, everybody, your comments and suggestions, right? Please keep them coming. Let me stop for a second and make sure I'm, I'm addressing and reading these and, and talking about them because I really do appreciate the, I want this to be a dialogue, right? So, so please don't be shy and don't stop. Um, if I'm rambling and don't get to your questions right away, don't stop, you know, don't stop the brainstorming. This is great. So I do appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, we're talking about science fiction. Big Law mentioned, you know, long cryosleep, um, waking up in an abandoned ship. You know, are they awake or not? Yes, that, there could be um, a couple ways to, to think about that. Um, you know, whether you're in a spaceship or whether you're on the ground. Um, as a quick aside, like I, I had a game idea, um, actually, that was kind of similar in this con concept for a bit that I thought was really great at one point that was... Um, basically the idea was that the, this meteor is heading towards earth and kind of like the, um, um, front the, the big meteor movie that where they did that and everybody went into the bunkers basically to go survive kind of the, the, the nuclear fallout, so to speak, from when the, the meteors hit. And, um, it wasn't Armageddon, but it was the other one that came out at the same time is that if you guys remember which meteor movie that was, there's been a, I mean, there's been a few of them, but the idea was that the, the, you as the player go down to these bunkers no, it wasn't Armageddon. There was another movie that came out almost, I think, the same year even as Armageddon, um, where they had to get it was a, it was like a younger kid that discovers the meteor and then um, gets a ticket to go down with his girlfriend or his family, and he ends up on the motorcycle try, at the very end trying to you know save the girl and the baby and stuff. Um, and so, but I, I forget the um, Deep Impact. I think it was called. Anyways idea would be that you were like a special forces guy. You went down to these bunkers. You thought the meteor was just going to come crashing to earth and just, you know, and, and kind of, it starts as like a typical thing. So you end up in cryostasis. And when you come out of it, um, I had this idea that the dinosaurs basically, you know, dinosaurs kind of disappeared on us. Like we never fully understood where and how and why dinosaurs sort of disappeared, you know, in our history. And I had this idea that, that really they, the dinosaurs, um, didn't die out. They actually, there was an alternate dimension, alternate reality that happened. And this meteor kind of coming by the earth basically triggered, triggered that, you know, millions of years ago. And so the dinosaurs actually ended up in an alternate sort of reality. And then when this meteor came back again, you know, 10 million years later, or whatever it's been, the dinosaurs now um, re-merge back with our reality, but the dinosaurs have now evolved for millions of years. And so now the dinosaurs are smart, have technology and stuff as well, but they still have big giant T-Rexes and things. And so you as a player come out of this cryo cryogenic thing, thinking that you're um, just going to um, like come to a sort of devastated earth. And when you awake and you come out of your bunker, you know, suddenly there's dinosaurs and stuff running around and dinosaur cities and all these kinds of things. And so I ha had kind of an interesting twist there that I had designed. Um, yeah, Deep Impact. Um, um, and so that was just an idea of like, and then you had to basically fight humans versus dinosaurs. And in this, in this particular thing, it was kind of like Planet of the Apes where the dinosaurs have taken over the U S and are taking over the world. You know, humans are now their slaves and you were going around and trying to find all these bunkers 
that were buried, you know, with all these military, you know, around the U.S. and around the world. Everybody had gone to these bunkers and was kind of still in stasis in my original idea. And you were you were trying to go around and sort of find all that equipment and wake up everybody and trying to build your army, you know, while you're fighting back against the dinosaurs, you know, and, and trying to kind of retake, you know, um, the earth, you know, from these dinosaurs and stuff. And so anyways, that, that your, your cryo comment kind of reminded me of that game idea I had. That was a little bit crazier idea, which we could explore again, but today is more about new ideas. But, but the point is you can, you can take a lot of ideas and then try to, you know, see what they stimulate, right? See, you know, or just even one thing like that cryo, statement you know suddenly triggered me and going like oh i had another idea and you know maybe that worked or maybe another thing works and so what i wanted to show you through that is that um even though it was a long-winded explanation of a previous idea but but you see that like no ideas to me are ever bad because a lot of my ideas come back to haunt me and come back to be used later on i mean it's a it's amazing how much i recycle a lot of my ideas and so i always keep my ideas around and whether I use them and make them into a game or maybe sometimes I just got a few pages of ideas or whatever, I've got, you know, folders and Google Drives full of, you know, kind of half-assed, half-worked, you know, ideas. But then there's always times like this where you're like, oh, wait, like that would be the perfect game, you know, the perfect idea for this. And, and so I like to try to recycle that stuff and keep that in mind. So I wanted to kind of show you how just even a single idea that somebody on the team might have or an executive might have you know, they might tell you like, hey, we want you to do a sci-fi game about this. And then suddenly you're like, hey, I got an idea. Like I already kind of did something that sort of halfway fit that. Let me rework that and, you know, and use it and make and make it into something. Right. Um, so so our ideas, whether we have them now or we've had them in the past or whatever, try to capture those. Try to hold on to these ideas, because, again, you never know, you know, whether it's a full finished game concept or whether it's something else, you never know when, it, when that will come back to be useful for you. Um, let's see here. Let me, sorry, I'm going to go back to your, all of your guys ideas. Um, um, yeah. And so the northbound you're talking about maybe something to do with two worlds Every person has a clone of himself or an alternate world. Yeah, um, possibly we can we can talk about that, um, how that sort of works. There's a lot of different angles there. Um, that two worlds also almost just kind of fit into my. I hadn't even read your comment yet, but that almost kind of fits back into the the universe I just talked about with the the two universes, the two you know ideas that the dinosaurs lived in one, the humans lived in one. They both evolved and then eventually kind of came back together again. Um, you know, sort of kind of that idea, but I mean, again, there's a lot of ways of understanding what do you, when you mean worlds, do you mean two different planets, two different, you know, dimensions, universes, you know, things like that. Um, so big glob, the world isn't a perfect opposite orbit. So they are always behind the sun, never visible to each other. Where everyone has a clone on the other world. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think, um, so Big Glob and Northbound, um, you know, I think that, let me finish the, the your train of thought here. So in that world, everything is perfect. So the characters can switch their clone in that world, but the consequences that the switch clones suffer in the world, they don't belong. The Northbound, once they're now in that alternate um, world where everything is perfect, find out they have to figure out if they can live with knowing a clone of them is suffering while they are having um, the time of their lives. Um, so that reminds me a little bit, a tiny bit about the, um, the sixth day, I think it was called with Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, where, you know, they make the clone, you know, of him. And, and then, you know, he realizes the clone is alive, you know, and that whole thing. Um, and so, um, I think from a, from a um, gameplay perspective, you know, I think what we have to kind of ask ourselves is if we had like two worlds or two things, when you have to switch back and forth between them, um, kind of what is that gameplay, right? Like, why would I do that? Is this just part of the story or is this something else that, um, um, 
you know, the player has to do. Right. And, um, and so, um, um, so I think that's something we kind of have to ask ourselves is like, what kind of gameplay would we see ourselves if we had two worlds and we were going, whether we were constantly going back and forth between them or whether this is just like, I, I was, I was raised or grew up in this world and then I, I knew about this world. Or I went to this world. And if I'm going back and forth, um, how the worlds vary or how they change, you know, um, the more worlds we create from a production standpoint, the, the harder it can be um, to create these worlds. And excuse me today. Um, so we need to understand that, right? We need to understand kind of like what would be the gameplay in that. So that's where I'm not exactly sure in your idea, like how we would work that into it. So let's, Let's keep thinking about it, but let's let's think about some other stuff, you know, that could go, you know, and um, and and be done there. Um, so, Jonathan, the um, Mountain Blade, I did play that a little bit, um, but let's you know, let's go look at it really quick. So. So this is, um, yeah, this is kind of reminding me of, um, yeah, I did, I did play this a little tiny bit. Um, and I think, yeah, you, you had to build these, these armies. And so again, part of this process is, is sort of understanding, you know, what are, um, these gameplay features, right. That we want to, that we want to create. Um, and yes, I could see to your point, Jonathan or, or others like, you know, that the, that the, that the building these armies is, is really cool. The, and again, I'm not trying to squelch ideas here. So don't, um, don't get me wrong in these analysis, but part of where my, where my, my head goes, where I'm always cautious. And I ask myself, you know, kind of about it is, um, you know, when you're building out these ideas, like for something that has mass battles like this, the technology behind these to build like these huge armies and things like that, while it's been done, um, that set of technology is kind of hard to build. Um, and it's, it's a whole different set of like character resolution, character, you know, um, things, you know, the, the technology to build and put say a thousand or even a hundred characters on screen is very different than putting 10 characters on screen. And so that's where these types of technologies are really good. Um, but they're also really hard to build, you know, if, if you've never built them because you have to have kind of almost two sets of technology where you might have, you know, the, the large scale army, almost RTS kind of armies. Um, but when you're down in, you know, in these types of of scenes, um, you know, this is really challenging technology to build the LOD systems and the technology, the AI and things like that for building, um, this type of, um, of a game is a lot more challenging, especially if it's going to zoom out, you know, and, and stuff. And so I think this is, um, this is interesting. I don't know. Um, If we can look at some, um, let's just see if we can find a, um, a trailer here. That's pretty impressive with the, the sheer scale of the, the battles and stuff. Well, that's a lot, a lot of soldiers.
Yeah, and then it zooms out almost RTS style. So yeah, it's a fair amount of, of complex gameplay there that you've got to figure out. So you can see that um, there's, a, there's a lot of different things here that are kind of going um, going on, right? And, um, and so that can be, you know, quite challenging. Um, let's see here. Let me go through some more comments here. Um, Let's see, Tony, um, maybe part of the meteor breaks off and you can use the dimension shifting rock material either as crafting materials or use them in some manner. Um, maybe they're rare revered. Um, revered. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the um, and I'm not, I wasn't proposing we use my meteor idea here. That was just an example of, of riffing on ideas, taking ideas from another team member and kind of running with them, you know, and trying to make something interesting, you know, out of somebody else's idea and taking them farther, right? And so, so don't get me wrong, I wasn't even proposing necessarily that we did the, the Meteor game, just kind of showing, you know, how one idea re reminding me of something, how another idea, you know, could inspire me, you know, to do something, right? Excuse me, my stomach's killing me today. Um, so northbound, um, the, the idea of, of playing as a word and some small characters, I'm not, um, you jump from book to book, trying to find the book you're missing from the levels are varied uh, levels vary upon the type of book and how well you as a played the word fit in. I'm not sure that. I'm getting that, and I and again, I, I think for today's conversation, I mean, we can definitely keep exploring that a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think or imagine something like Psychonauts, or um, I'm trying to think of a game that's kind of like that, um, where you know, I mean, we you could do, I guess, a. Uh, I'm not sure about playing as a word and exactly what you meant there. Um, we could do something where. You know, maybe, you know, your plane is like, um, I'm trying to think of like a, a way of like playing as a fable, right? Or, or playing, a, you know, something where, where, um, what was the other, I'm trying to remember um, something else. Like, um, this is a really bad analogy, but like, if you guys remember the movie with Schwarzenegger again, the last action hero, um, where they had the magic movie ticket and they could go into different movies and then kind of become part of that movie. Um, what if we had something similar where, you know, uh, where each world, as we call it, maybe is a, is a book, right? And this, and this, you know, whatever thing of magic that you have allowed you to go into these books, right? And become part of the book. And, you know, but we'd have to find a reason why, like, what were you doing in that book or why, why are you jumping from book to book or what was the, the reason that the compulsion for, for going there and doing that. Right. Um, so that's just something to, to, to think about for a second. Um, and so, um, so anyways, I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea. I'm just not quite sure at this second, like how I would take it cause it's a little bit different. Um, and again, some of the games like Psychonauts, when I worked on that, were challenging because you know that was inside people's brains and in, in, in their minds right and and so kind of a similar thing where we were jumping into people's minds and each mind was really different and one of the production problems we had with psychonauts was that each world and each each mind was so different um, that we kind of like had a different team building each level in each world and it ultimately um, made our production, probably five times harder, 10 times harder than it should have been. 
um, because there was there wasn't a lot of overlap between the worlds and things like that. So that you know that ran into some some major production problems, right? So I think that's something that we need to to try to understand. Um, excuse me. Um, so big lob, yes. I think um, what kind of game and and um, is important at, at some levels, right? I mean, right now, there's there's not a there's not a right or wrong answer. I think um, what I'm le what I'm leaning towards, kind of going back to our oops our document here, um, is I think that I'll put under gameplay features, um, but I'll say kind of like action RPG, um, you know, um, light RPG elements, um, combat, um, you know, so, you know, first or third person, um, maybe let's go third person just to be a little bit different. Um, you know, but I'm happy to explore um, first person, if we want, um, you know, um, and so what I'm, you know, what I'm leaning towards there just to do the, yeah, so probably over the shoulder, um, you know, um, and again, this is all up for debate, right? None of this is, not a single word on here is locked down, right? So so you're welcome to question absolutely anything on here. Um, we are penciling things in. We are putting down ideas so that we begin to shape things and begin to, to do them that way. And so don't take any of this as law. None of this is like um, hard, you know, hard done. I think where I'm getting with that is that it's more... Um, you know, I'll put it here, um, story driven. So, so part of, part of what I'm trying to achieve there and part of what I'm trying to, to do in that is that, you know, creating a world, um, more like the Witcher or something like that. Right. And, and thinking about like, you know, how do you create something, you know, like a sci-fi Witcher or, things like that. So I want to create something that I like, right? I want to create a world and a universe that I like um, and stuff like that. Now, I want to throw out there, um, so so, so we'll put sci-fi theme right now because that seems to be, um, you know, um, part of what we're wanting. Now, granted, like sci-fi Witcher could be seen as cyberpunk, right? But cyberpunk's kind of its own its own little niche, right? Cyberpunk has its own thing. And so the, the, the Cyberpunk 2077 and The Witcher were kind of the same game and you could kind of get a sense for how they took The Witcher and made it science fiction-y, right? But, but it definitely is a, is a different um, kind of game. And yes, I agree, The Witcher is a open world game and we're, we're trying to not do that, right? And so so that's, um, but I'm, I'm just thinking about the, the the game experience, the camera, and kind of the world a little bit, and you know, could that world be made a little more linear and stuff that's more controllable versus the the open worldness of like The Witcher, right? And so, so I'm using The Witcher as kind of that that more. I, I like the experience. I love The Witcher. It's one of my my favorite games, and I'm trying to think of some other stuff um, that's that's kind of relevant to that. But let's let's hold on to that for a second. I want to really quickly go back. And I'm trying to catch up on everybody's, um, 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 you know, I'm going to even say like, you know, so kind of trying to define this. Um, and part of the, part of the reason for also this third person stuff here is, um, is good platforming elements, um, you know, so, um, like, so, you know, um, you know, that type of, of thing, I, I personally like games that have a lot of, you know, advanced movement 
and and things like that. So so when I'm thinking third person, those are generally better for you know um, you know um, heavier world interactions, right? So that, that's just where my brain's taking me for my personal preference. Um, so so let's just keep keep going there. Um, so Jonathan, you mentioned War Banner, which I'm not familiar with. So let me, um, you know, that's, so So a lot of this is also about like, okay, what are these things at? Um, was it, let's see here. So Jonathan, you mentioned War Banner, but I'm seeing Mountain Blade War Band. Was that the was that the game you were? Or there's Mountain Blade Banner Lord. Okay, for Mountain Blade. Okay, just wanted to just trying to. Um... So let's look at the trailer really quick for that, because it's important that we all kind of have a common design language of things that we sort of all understand and that's the beauty of games but what well, the hard thing is there's so many tens of thousands of games out there that it's really hard to sometimes have the exact same design language you know when we haven't played the same games um and so um so that's something that you know um even with your design team or with yourself when you're thinking of things again it's good to go like Normally, I would go watch a lot of trailers, watch some reviews, you know, watch some overviews, some playthroughs, or play it myself, you know, that kind of thing, just to sort of when something is maybe slightly interesting. So, um, again, this is um, um, interesting just with the large scale battles. They're definitely um, on the, um, again, the, from a technology standpoint, they're complicated, but let's assume that that's okay for now all right so very interesting though I, I do like that idea of larger scale battles um let's see um Let me see here. So I'm reading through just all these great comments everybody's got. So uh, appreciate again everybody that's that's chiming in here. Um, especially Big Glob, Jonathan, Tony, you know, um, great stuff. So yeah, so Big Glob, I don't know about the space janitor. I mean, again, you could set up a, a hero's journey for like how they're how they're going to kind of rise and deal with that but i'm not sure um if we wanted to try to do comedy which is really really hard to do um that's a that's a whole nother another thing um let's see here yeah so jonathan wall running maybe you know again just just whether that's more advanced movement more advanced combat it's it's something that that i always kind of tend to like it gives more world interaction you know more detail to the world but again let's uh, Let's not try to define exactly what that means yet, other than just we know that we're going to interact with the world, I think, I hope, in kind of some some new ways, right? Or, or just some more advanced ways versus just running around a really simple world. Um, um, so, Tony, going with the media and sci-fi, since I like both those things, what about game where you, you know... Um, some sort of asteroid miner, but the greedy corporate guys back home said your mission isn't profitable. Um, so again, what's the, what I'm challenging you on is what's the gameplay there, right? You can set up a story and a backstory, right? And so like if you were a miner and they bring you back home or, you know, you're on a, so first of all, there could be a scenario, of, I'm a miner on, a, on an asteroid. Like, why is that fun, right? Like, what am I going to do? on that asteroid, how how would I make mining fun, right? And that, that to me would be kind of a challenge. I mean, not to say we couldn't do that, but I think that's not quite what we're going after here. Um, and um, and if they bring you back home and now you're a disgruntled miner, you would want to be able to use those mining skills, you know, in some way, shape or form, 
or you'd have to have, you know, something. There, there, there have to be a background of why you're disgruntled and what you're trying to do. Now, maybe it's just you're pissed off, you know, because you lost your job and now you're going after the big corporate entities, right? But, but I still think that it's important to try, if we can, to tie together these ideas behind, like, who or what we were. Are we just, you know, I, a minor, a normal, average, everyday person? Um, or are we something else, you know, that, that, that's, um, that has some meaning and some context, um, you know, and, you know, and then there's, there, is there something deeper to it? Um, and think about, uh, ref forgive me today for referencing a, a lot of Schwarzenegger movies. He's a fan of my, or I'm a fan of his, I should say. And, um, and I just was coming to mind when you talked about minor and, you know, all that stuff, like, you know, thinking about, um, um, Total Impact. Was it Total Impact? Um, what was the, yeah, the, the Schwarzenegger, Total Recall, sorry. But uh, having one of those days. So um, so think about the Total Recall project, you know, Total Recall movie with Schwarzenegger where he's like on earth, you know, and, you know, he was kind of, I guess, construction worker more than a miner, but, you know, and then, you know, the whole thing happens and he ends up back in Mars, but he's kind of got the, you know, now he's a spy, but he's a mine, you know, and they're doing the mining and whatever. I mean, there was a little bit of like correlation there between kind of who and what he was, but he was still something bigger. Um, and that could be interesting, but again, I'm not quite sure the correlation there. So I'm just brainstorming again. I don't want to shoot down ideas, but I'm just trying to understand them, right? And try to, 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 to see how we could go, um, go farther. Um, and yes, maybe the, the the mining you know operation again like you know reveals. I'm trying to remember where this has been done. I mean, I know it's been done before, but like you know, how do I go and like create an idea like around a um, um, like maybe I find aliens right, and I and I and I find something there. Even that Total Recall movie right at the end, like they find the big alien thing that makes the the I'll call it a machine for lack of a better definition. And then they, you know, he puts his hand on the, the strange alien hand thing and then it creates all the air, you know, to, to, to save Mars kind of thing. Um, so, again, whether you're, whether you're discovering things, um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, even the original Aliens um, mythology. And I, and I don't think this was what was true in Aliens 1, but if you guys remember, like, the, the Aliens franchise... Um, James Cameron's original Aliens movies. Um, I think prequel was it Aliens three or one of those where they kind of have an origin story about some of the aliens, you know. And again, those were I think were found somewhere, you know, and then ultimately were were discovered. And then you know, and it, and it wasn't those miners that were like on the planet. I remember Ripley; they were on some really harsh planet. Or something like that, and you know, and then they ended up, you know, discovering the aliens and sort of bringing them back to life or whatever, you know, and then that, then that ultimately got out and kind of got out of control. But there was there was one of the movies or something that had something there of like the origins of like the original aliens, um, and so um, um, so some of that, you know, could be could be possible, right? So, um, so Marcus, um, thanks for, um, so outward, let's look at outward. So whenever you guys are bringing up games, I want to try to, um, look at them a little bit and, um, and stuff because I want again to, to develop the, the design language, um, for kind of understanding, you know, what are these games? What is it about them? You know, and, and again, we're, we're going kind of fast today. Um, so don't, um, don't expect that your normal ideation process, excuse me, would be this short or, or, um, or this easy, right? Um, you know, so, so not to say that we're even going to wrap this up today, you know, um, but I'm just trying to get you guys an idea of like how this is, a, this is a, um, and I really, again, appreciate sincerely every, everybody's comments and stuff. This is a great brainstorming session, right? And if you're a working game designer, um, this is not too dissimilar 
Now, granted, it's a little bit easier when you're in person and we can riff a little faster and we can look at things and stuff. But, you know, I've been in the room a dozen times or hundreds of times, really, with, you know, a room full of designers, you know, where we're having the same discussion. Like, hey, guys, what are we going to work on? And, and you just keep going down. You're chasing ideas. And, you know, one person gets a, a good idea and we might, you know, literally have a, a big screen TV there where we're doing exactly this and we're, we're pulling up stuff. And we're looking at it and we're talking about it. And, you know, and we would talk about, well, what is it about, you know, this that you like? What is it about this game that, that you know, that, um, you know, that you, that you enjoy, right? So, so, you know, as a survival game, you know, and, and sort of survival being this, like, I'm, I'm maybe for sci-fi, right? Maybe survival is about, hey, I'm stuck on this alien planet, um, maybe back to, um, um, Big Lob's idea of, you know, we're, you know, we're a miner or something, right? And maybe we get stuck on a planet, you know, maybe the, maybe the corporation, you know, decides to cancel us, but really they just abandon us, right? Maybe it's the kind of thing that, um, is, you know, we, we get abandoned there and we have to survive. Um, and, um, you know, there's lots of ways to go about it. I, I really like, um, some of the survival game type mechanics, um, I might've mentioned this book to you guys. I actually, I'm almost positive. I mentioned it to you for those of you that, that have been, um, watching me for a while. Um, there is a, um, oops, sorry, let me put it here. Um, so there is a book, um, Oh, sorry, Tony. Yeah, I just was looking at the, um, yeah, so I see, yeah, you guys were kind of riffing on the, so I'm trying to keep up with all your great comments. Um, yeah, so, oh uh, yeah, there you go. So instead of bringing you back home, they just discontinue your mission discreetly. Great. Okay. Great minds are thinking alike here. Um, and, um, so I think that the, um, so yeah, so there's, so the survival game, you know, is definitely, um, an aspect of, um, of stuff. I'm sorry, I'm going through all of your comments. So <laughs> I apologize here if it's taking me a minute. Um, you know, so, um, so there was another, um, yeah, so the survival aspects and outwards, um, Marcus brought up, um, and, um, so the, um, let's see. Yeah. Rust was a huge survival game. Let me look at, let's show everybody kind of rust again, just to, to bring that up. Um, now I'm just curious to kind of do a bit of a poll here. What, what do you guys, you know, in, in, we'll call it a, the survival genre for now, for lack of a better definition, um, what are your guys' feelings about the survival genre like Rust um, being probably one of the bigger survival games that I know of, but there's been lots of others. Um, what do you guys think of the survival game genre in general? Like, what do you like and don't like about the, the general concept of survival games um, in general and what's been out there? I'd love to get um, a little bit of just general ideation around survival games right now. Let, let's explore this idea farther. So let's, let's, you know, I'd love to get feedback on just in general, whether it's a sci-fi survival game or any of the other survival games out there, some good examples of games you've really liked, but I wonder why you like them. Like, so, so as a game designer, one of, one of our most important skills is, is asking the silly question, why? And I, and I joke about this a lot. I talk about this a lot, um, and, and things in that we have to keep asking ourselves why, and we have to keep, you know, um, um, you know, asking others, you know, or about, you know, like, why did they do this? Why did they do that? Right. And trying to truly understand what is it about the game experience? What is it about the game that you like and don't like, you know, what, what's with the genre that's there. And then in a minute, we'll get into like ideation about how would we make it better? Right. And so, 
So let's let's talk about that a little bit. And, and first, I just want to know um, um, what it is you know uh, predominantly about survival games in general that you really love, and then anything that you just like is a is a is a really high level generality about survival games in general. So um, yeah, I do I do believe. Um, Marcus, I, I'm not 100% sure, and Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that, that Rust and a lot of the survival games do have um, a lot of like permadeath, you know, and things like that, where it can be, you know, um, really easy to, to die in them. Um, I would also put maybe Ark um, Survival Evolved is probably one of the other big games in this category, um, being dinosaurs and stuff like that, but... But you know, Ark has a lot of um, excuse me. Ark has a lot of um, like sci-fi and other kinds of things in it as well. But let's focus on not the theme really per se, but really about the gameplay, right? Um, and um, so something else, you, just a thing here is. Um, We'll kind of let this play while we're while we're talking a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I agree, guys. Like permadeath, I I hate, and that's one of the things I'm not a a big fan of either. Um, but um, yes, that's one of the things. Like when you when you invest a lot into something, right, and then they you know take it all away, um, you know, and and stuff, or you don't have really good feedback about. Um, stuff that's where I get really frustrated right and and so um, I do think Ark is one of the better survival games out there um, I know that I've got friends like Darren um, who's just the hardest of the hardcore like you know Ark players and it's funny because like every time I talk to my buddy Darren like he bitches and complains about Ark like um, endlessly but yet he still doesn't stop playing it, right? And and it's it's um, um, so so Jonathan, you know, and you guys, what is it that's appealing? Tell tell me just a little bit. It doesn't have to be long. I know it's hard in text. Um, and again, this 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 conversation would be a thousand times easier if we could all be chatting live, you know, um, to do that. But I think that um. There, you know, there's something about the, the the survival games that are appealing, obviously, to some to some people, right? And and if we take permadeath out of it, if we take some of that the, those annoying things out of it, um, and um, you know, I think there there can be some very interesting stuff there. Um, so, real quick, one of the things I wanted to point out, what we're doing here in this particular video is this is a Top 10 new survival games of 2020, right? So um, people on the internet, people on YouTube, there's a lot of, I have to say, really bored people or companies or whatever they are that have put together some just fantastically amazing videos that like save my butt so many times because I can't even tell you how many billions of hours this you know these types of videos have saved me when I'm doing research and reference, right? Um, and so, um, and for brainstorming and ideation, these are sometimes like the fastest, easiest ways. They're just giving you highlights. They're looking at stuff. Occasionally, I'll just fast forward through it, you know, or, or whatever the case is. I'm trying to show you guys today tools and techniques for how to think, how to come up with ideas, how to ideate, how to brainstorm, right? That's what today is about. Um, today isn't necessarily about getting a super concrete idea. Um, but, but like, here's a mining idea, right? Like, they were doing some mining here, like, you know, you know, that was almost part of what we were just talking about, right? Um, and, you know, and obviously here they're, they're building a space station and they're, and they're trying to survive, you know, on a pretty harsh, looks like Mars or something like that. Yes, and so the base building is a, is a big part of this. Um, and um, so one of the things I wanted to go back to really quick um, is um, the... Um, 
Um, and Tony Rock Rocky just started a comment about open world and survival games. We can, we can again, you know, I'm trying to avoid open world in, in some regards, but again, that's not a hard rule, right? And so I'm not against doing survival games. And I think a survival game as an open world is a slightly different beast than trying to build like the next Far Cry or the next Assassin's Creed or something like that, right? Because the, the games are a little bit more emergent and the games are more about free form and kind of going around. And so they're a little bit easier to build typically. Um, and um, so I, I want you guys to sort of be still open to things and still, you know, well, that's kind of cool. That's a big, big rolling storm of some kind. <laughs> um, and so, but I agree, like, like base building is, is kind of fun, right? It's, it's almost taking like RTS type base building or other types of things. Um, other games like Fallout or whatever have had some types of base building in them as well. Um, and so I agree that bases can become these fun permanent homes. And, you know, and maybe, you know, in our particular survival game that we're building, maybe it's not a fully open world. Maybe it's it's larger levels and areas and regions where we're on islands or we're on various things. And maybe we build a base here, but then we can like, you know, travel out to some different areas, you know, and stuff. And instead of it just being a free form, go like 100% anywhere, it's more like, you know, big hubs, you know, around or something. So maybe we can control it a little bit better, you know, in its scope and scale, right? Um, part of the survival is obviously like, you know, in a lot of these games is eating, you know, hunting, um, trying to get food, gather food, you know, things like that. So, th so there's a combat perspective, both with natural, you know, local things here, um, but it also can be competition, um, you know, um, between whether it's other players or, or things like that, that can be very interesting. So, um, what are your guys' thoughts on like survival games in this whole, like, I got to get food. I got to stay warm. I got to survive. Right. So the survive in survival games, right. Um, do you like that? Do you, do you like having to worry about like how hot I am or cold I am? And am I getting hypothermia? Do I need to eat? Um, do I need to drink water? Like that, that simulation for lack of a better definition aspect of what a lot of survival games kind of get into. Do you guys like that? Like, is that is that a set of design features that you find appealing or do you find that annoying? I want to hear like what you guys think about those types of features in survival games. Um, so big law, build your own station. You're flying your ship. It's a twin stick shooter while mining with your ship and defending against aliens. Um, I want to try to keep the game all in the same set of controls. I'm not against um, putting vehicles in the game, but I would want to do it in the third person um, kind of realm of, of what we were trying to, to accomplish um, there versus like going into another mode while I'm mining and I got a dual stick shooter and then I'm flopping back down into a third person action game. I, I want to keep the world more immersive and, and keep you kind of integrated with the experience there. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, I'm telling you, you know, with the asteroid idea, there's a lot of ways we can take it. And we don't necessarily have to settle on it this minute. I mean, we, we can we can pencil in things and mechanics there um, for what we like, right? What is it about the asteroids that we like? You know, maybe, maybe it's the kind of thing where, you know, an asteroid has hit the planet that we're on, you know, and, you know, it has caused significant damage, you know, and that's what's that we're trying to survive from. Maybe there's lots of smaller asteroids that are constantly coming down and constantly causing damage and, you know, and kind of disrupting our world all the time. Maybe it's the threat of the bigger asteroid coming and we've got something to do with that and it's changing things and causing weird weather or other kinds of stuff. Um, you know, so, so in that, um, um, context, you know, what is it about, you know, the asteroids that we like, right? And I don't, I don't expect us to solve that this second, but I think that's a good thing that we can kind of um, pencil in. So, so, so to that point, you might want to come back here. And again, um, what we might do here is just say like, let's see here. 
Gameplay features. Great ideas to maybe use, right? So again, um, you know, I don't want to lose ideas, right? And um, and so, so this this is where you want to start um, penciling things in here. Um, so like. Now I'm I'm gonna um, I'm going to put this kind of as features and, and the and the reason I'm saying this um, as survival game features is I'm not sure if we want to do a survival game or you know meaning that that genre of game or do we like the the concept of what survival game, the, the features and some of those things that people like in survival games, but maybe maybe we do a hybrid, you know, in that that it's really, in fact, let's move this up here. Um, you know, and, and to say, you know, here's some survival game features as part of this action adventure game, right? And so, so what is it about the, the, you know, these things that we really like, right? What is it about that kind of stuff that we're that we're enjoying, you know, and so we could start, you know, listing some things, um, you know, survival, food, water, clothing, um, um, right, um. You know, we can say collecting, um, hunting, you know, et cetera, right? Um, you know, so, um, There's a um, interesting movie. Um, I don't know if you guys have. have I just saw this uh, a few days ago. Um, have you guys heard of the movie Greenland? Um, this was a, a relatively new movie. I just came out last year, um, and um, this had some very interesting stuff. And this was. Another one of those, I didn't even know what it was. Uh, I like him as an actor. Um, and so all I kind of knew was he started it. And then I saw that it, was, that it was on. And so I watched it. And um, this was a asteroid comet um, ultimately coming to Earth. And, you know, and they're trying to get to Greenland ultimately to survive into some bunkers. So this actually, um, this movie kind of combined a couple of the ideas that we had um, in that these, these, these fragments, um, well, I, if I remember right, and sorry, I'm a little fuzzy. I think that they were expecting one really big one to hit. They have a bunch of people. You can see, boom, he just got hit by like the part of the um, of of one of them. But the, the the asteroids were not did not hit in the places they were expecting, and um, they were ultimately um, supposed to go into these bunkers and. And then they missed their flight, you know, and, they, and, and stuff. And so these asteroids are coming down as these guys are trying to figure out how to survive, right? And he gets separated from his wife. Um, and, they're, and they're, you know, trying to get reconnected and things like that. Um, I don't want to um, ruin this for everybody. But if you haven't seen this, decent movie. It wasn't great. Um, but um, thematically does follow a bunch of the ideas, again, that we are thinking about. And so my point of these of this is is that when we start to go down a path, when we start to, to um, when we start to have ideas that our inspirations can come from anywhere, right? Our inspirations can come from from books. 
Our inspirations can come from, you know, movies, other games. So we don't have to just look at games for reference, right? Um, this is a scene here where, the, like, suddenly all the asteroids were coming down. And, like, this could totally, totally be a game level right here where you're just, you know, um, doing things. And so they, they, had some, they had some pretty interesting stuff there that was usable as a... Um, um, is a game idea, right? You know, that you could have made some very interesting, challenging levels or scenarios or things like that um, to, um, to, to create, you know, and utilize this idea that asteroids were coming. And that's, again, only one, one idea, right? Like, just like I mentioned earlier, you know, I have this idea of like the post-apocalyptic, you know, post-asteroid you know, kind of world as well, right? And and so there's the there's the it's coming at us, it's it's hitting us, and it's the you know the post apocalyptic you know what happens afterwards. And keep in mind that if we're gonna build a game, if we're gonna build a franchise, um, you know that is bigger than just maybe a single game. You know, um, how is it that these things are gonna be built to, and to escalate? You know, and how can we keep building this franchise there? And so, so one of the dangers with, even though I, I like the idea of, of having an asteroid coming down and sort of actively doing stuff to us, is that a sustainable idea that we can keep using, you know, throughout, throughout the entire game? Is it just something that comes in during a level? Is it like something that, that we're going to use in kind of a bigger way, Right. And so that's something that, that I want you guys to sort of understand that that, that, that doesn't mean that, that it's not an idea that can be used or couldn't be used, um, but it may not necessarily be an idea that can, that can utilize or be utilized for the entirety of the game, right? And then let alone if I want to do sequels or things like that, right? So, so one of my goals, and let's put that in there, you know, because I, I want to put that in there, this thing is... Um, Build a franchise. So, you know, my my goal here is that, you know, um, the ideas need to be big, right? Um, th this needs to be a world. So this is, you know, You know, um, right? So, so is this something that, that that we can build that's a little bit bigger? And I know this is harder, um, but I but I, I I like challenging this from the start. I like questioning whether this is something that I could really make it interesting enough that that I can make it into something that's a little bit bigger, right? Is this something that's that's a little bit more you know there? So. Um, Hmm. Um, so let me, I'm going to go look at some and read some comments here. Sorry guys, if I'm falling behind. So I agree, Marcus, like the complete, you know, doesn't necessarily, that the asteroid shouldn't necessarily, you know, um, be the full game, right? And the, and the survival stuff maybe is not um, there. And so I agree, big law of like managing hunger and thirst and things like that, you know, can be, um, um, so the, um, so they're, they're a slippery slope, right? Um, and, um, yeah, so Tony, you know, like, likes the hunger and thirst, but, you know, again, as long as you're not too aggressive, like too quick to die, um, you know, and yes, it can get annoying, um, yeah, Tony, you know, morale or whatever, so we could add that, um, you know, let's see here, breathing. You know, I'm just kind of saying, you know, what is fun, right? What, what do we like? Um, So big law of upgradable items the PC can build to help detect whether different materials are found. Upgrades increase range and the rarity of materials detected. Um, uh, 
Okay, we got a spammer here. Let me block them really quick. It's amazing how we always get one one spam per per live stream. It seems like uh, the joys of technology and the mis misuse of people. So, um, Jonathan, whenever an asteroid hits, it's first come for serve for the rare materials. You might have to be able to fight, defend yourself from other survivors looking for the materials from the asteroid. Yeah, and that could be, you know, a great um, a great idea here. So, um, so the asteroids have raw materials to find and fight for, right? Thanks, Tony. Yeah, the, the dinosaur game was was I I thought was still a pretty pretty cool, pretty original concept, you know. And you know, I even had concept art of like dinosaurs with like lasers strapped to their heads. So like T Rexes and things were still identifiable in that world. Um, you know, that you could see they were T Rex, but they they had evolved for millions of years, you know, and kind of gotten smarter and and things. But they were you know dinosaurs were still at a glance a dinosaur. You could kind of tell what you know what they were you know originally but it still was um unique enough that it was different and also i had the idea in that game that they had built like godzilla sized like super creatures you know and their their equivalent of a super weapon would be kind of all the the kaiju level type stuff that we'd find you know an ultraman or, or godzilla or whatever in the you know, and, and so even even a normal T-Rex, you know, even though it's huge, like a human's like this, right? A T-Rex is like this, and then Godzilla's like this, you know, kind of thing. And so even the even the dinosaurs had bred, you know, these these Godzilla-sized monsters, you know, to, to use as kind of their big super weapons and used in their wars and battles and stuff like that. So I even had that conceptually where there was big, massive, you know, creatures that you had to learn how to control um, and things like that. So... Let's take a step back for a minute. So, so we're we're going down some paths. We 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 may or may not like these ideas of the paths we're going down. Um, and you know, I think we want to kind of question ourselves of like, what is it about this world that's interesting? You know, what is it about survival games? Because there's been a lot of survival games, and um, so the 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 survival games. Um, are interesting at some levels to me, um, and they're obviously decently popular. But they're, but you know, and there and there's things in them that are um, that are interesting. But but again, you know, they're they're still somewhat niche, right? They're still somewhat, you know, like you can kind of argue like they've got their core audience. That doesn't mean it's not a big core audience. Um, but but you might you know want to know like are they good enough, right? Now here now here's a Another way to think about it. So again, part of what I want to do here for a second is um, is understand what the market size is. So part of part of our research that we want to do when we're ideating and we're trying to figure out excuse me, what it is that we want to build. Um, and um, we'll, Jonathan, we'll look at second extinction just in a second. Um, you know, is is really like. Again, we, we need a good idea, right? But but generally, if we're dealing with upper executives or, or whatever, right? I mean, ultimately in the end, when we're building AAA games, somebody has to validate our ideas and that means somebody has to pay for it, right? So so the, the process to step back for a second of how a game goes from an idea to a game that gets greenlit and actually gets produced is very complicated, right? It's not just like, I mean... If you are a really top designer, and I wouldn't even put myself in this category, right? Um, that, you know, occasionally if you're a rock star and you're somebody who has had a massive success, like you just, you know, you just shipped game of the year, right? And you were the, the creative director, the project director, executive producer, the guy, the God behind, you know, game of the year kind of game, right? Occasionally, if you've got a great idea and you're that guy, like somebody might give you a blank check that says, go make whatever you want to make, right? And they'll just, you know, and they'll let you kind of go do your thing. And I've seen that happen. But, you know, those are those are the the rock stars of the world that the rest of us don't, you know, that's not a world that even I live in, right? 
we have to normally prove ourselves. We have to kind of like, you know, figure out how do we come up with an idea? And then ultimately, how do I get that idea greenlit? Which means that I need to get it funded, right? I need to have a team behind it. And, you know, and that team costs money. And at some point, whether I'm going to build it out as a prototype or a concept or whatever it is, um, ultimately, we need to build something that, that people are going to approve and people are going to want to allow us to make. Now, um, so the, the challenge of that is that ultimately we need something kind of sexy enough and cool enough that the people are willing to invest in it, right? That they're willing to say like, yeah, why don't you go spend some time, whether it's yourself or you and a small team or whatever that is to go explore that idea. And sometimes you're lucky to, to be, you know, and have enough clout at a, a big studio, right? To, to go do that. You know, occasionally when I was at Microsoft or I was at EA or things, we would, you know, we had enough respect or, or time or whatever that, that people would, would say like, Hey, go, go design this for a little bit. And then like, let's throw a little bit of resources at it. Let's spend a little bit of money on it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll give you kind of the, the equivalency budget of, you know, I'll just use a random number, a million dollars, right? So if it's a $20 million game, we might be given a million dollars to go explore this idea and, and, and see if it's anything that's worth merit, but we still need to have we still need to have enough that we need to, we need to be able to show that this idea is going to be something that they want to build. Right. So, so, so we as game designers, project directors, whatever our job title is, whatever is the creative visionary, whether we are part of a team or whether this is our idea from the start, we've got to ultimately sell somebody, right? Somebody's got to believe in us. Somebody's got to like our idea. We have to be able to articulate that idea in such a way that they, you know, that they get it. Right. And that's then that can be a hard thing, because, again, this is that 80 20 rule. Right. If I just get some really crazy idea and you're like, whoa, let's go do like all this. And people are like, how? Like, I don't get it. Like, why is that fun? Who would buy it? You know, those kinds of things. Right. So so the ideas are important and we and, and we have to be able to have the idea, articulate the idea. But we also got to sell the idea. Right. And, and so as game designers, you know, I, I, I hate to use the analogy of like used car salesman, but we kind of are, right? We, we got we to gotta be that slimy guy that's going to go in there and make friends with everybody. We got to go find like the C-level executives. We got to go find the marketing guys. We got to go find the creative leadership of the company and figure out who's the money guy and like who's really got the power, you know, and we got to go schmooze with them a little bit and we got to get our idea you know, plant it in their things and kind of go like, okay, what's the process here, right? How how do I get a new game off the ground at this company? Because that's that's a whole live stream and, and 10 in and of itself. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about it at a later date of like, how do you go through that process and how do you understand wh whether that company has an existing process or how do I create, you know, and something that ultimately can get greenlit, meaning I can put, you know, resources and time and money into this outside of my own sweat equity, meaning nights and weekends and whatever, right? So there's been many times where I've been at a company and I've been I've been working on stuff in nights and weekends just to get an idea off the ground, and, you know, and then I have to try to go sell it, but it sucks. So I'm kind of spending my own time doing it, right? And then I, I may or may not get any respect for that. And so, so part of what we need to prove, part of, of their, what we have to show is that that there's an audience for this and that there's that there's sales numbers and figures that we can kind of really truly realistically look at you know and say like there is a market for this and and here's why and here's how i think and can kind of prove ish a little bit you know that that we can do well right that, that there's some potential here and there also has to be this idea of like how do i make this a little bit different a little bit special i can't just go like make the next Halo or make the next survival game, right? And so part of what I want to get into in a second um, is really how do we differentiate this thing? How do we make it special, right? And how do we make it different? Like with survival games and we're going down that road, like how, how do we make this different, right? I mean, it might be as simple as going from something that's a highly, like The Witcher, like highly fantasy to highly, you know, to something that's sci-fi and we create something that's new and unique with a few, 
you know, features. That could be fine. But if it's something completely, totally new and different and just so out there, right, it's harder to sell, right? And so, so part of that process for me now, as we get into ideation a little bit deeper, as we get into just sort of like, like, okay, there's the things I like, right? And that's, that's an important part, as I said, of, of, of the choices I'm going to make. But there's also kind of the like, can I sell this? Can I, can, is this idea worth their, you know, worth exploring? And can I prove to somebody else this idea is worth spending money and time on? Because if I can't do that, um, you know, it, it's not worthwhile. There, there's a lot of genres out there um, and a lot of games out there that have you know, won a lot of awards even, you know, and, and there's games out there that, that have done incredibly well in, in the, you know, in the Metacritic scores, you know, in the awards or they, they've, you know, they've won, you know, game of the year and they've gotten all these kinds of stuff. But then you go look at their sales figures and you're like, ooh, um, and I'm trying to, uh, and I'm drawing a blank on some of these games and I, I can't remember if like Shadow of the Colossus, um, which I think some of you might have just mentioned. Um, and, um, you know, the, some of these other games out there where they were very highly rated. They, they, they were, you know, incredibly well done. Um, everything about them you, you would think would be very successful. However, when you actually look at real sales figures, I've seen games like that that maybe had 100,000 copies sold. Um, and, and you've seen that, you know, from one example and maybe even from several examples. And, and so you quickly realize like, well, my break even, you know, of a, and if you guys don't know, I'll talk about that just for a second. Um, break even is, is the amount of money I have to make in order to recoup all of my costs. So if you, if you factor in, Every penny that you're going to spend in making a game, that's the development of the game. Um, the, the, on the, you know, from the developer side, that could be also, you know, if the publisher is spending money, um, if you have a publisher and that could be in QA to localization to, you know, other things that are outside building like the, the core, core, core of the game, right? There's, there's other development costs that, that often the developer is not aware of, right? There are, there are other things going into the development, you know, licensing fees, uh, whatever it is, right? Um, that's there. And then there's the, you know, even platform fees when I'm going to sell it. You know, if I have to go to Xbox or PlayStation, um, they're taking 30%. So like, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, and then there's marketing, user acquisition, you know, all these, there's all these costs, right? And so, so when I have say a $20 million game to develop and I have maybe a $20 million, you know, I'm using this as a rough average number of a triple A game, you know, from a few years ago. And, you know, sometimes that's up at 50 million or a hundred million dollars now, but, but let's just say it's a 20, $25 million game. Well, you know, there might be another five or $10 million being spent, you know, in other places in development, like from the publishing side. And then there might be another $20 million, you know, spent, um, um, there. And so, so when it's all said and done, um, let's just, let's just say the, the total number, the total investment into a game is going to be like $50 million. And we'll use that, you know, as a higher end expensive budget, you know, that's an all in, you know, everything we've spent to get this game out, you know, for the first six months. Well, you know, if you're selling a game, you know, at $70 and you start doing the math and, and we won't break that all down today, but when you start breaking it down and you figure out how much, you know, by the time you take 30% out to go to Microsoft or Sony on their platform fees and just everything else, when you start adding up that money and you start thinking about, okay, let's just say, for, to make the math really easy that we, that we make $50, you know, um, per copy. And it's not, and it's not that it's going to be a lot less, but let's just say for now it's 50, $50 per copy. And we have a $50 million cost. Then if I sell 1 million copies of my game, that's $50 million. So my break even as we call it would be 1 million copies. So my break even would be, I need to sell at least a million copies of this thing just to not lose money. Right. And, and so initially you may be like, oh, that's kind of easy, right? Um, like I have to do, you know, um, only a million copies and you, and you can look at some other game and go like, oh, okay, well, you know, they're selling X amount. So I think I'm okay.
but but you need to kind of prove that you need to kind of you know and and if there's and if there's big games like a, like in mobile for example you look at Pokemon Go or you look at some other kinds of games out there or even look at like Apex Legends or some some game that's you know had 75 million copies downloaded in you know in the first week there's unicorns right so so if there's outliers out there and there's one or two or three unicorns that that do like say 50 million copies you know you can't put a business model together that says like well I think we can be as good as Apex Legends or as good as Metal Gear Solid or as good as Zelda, right? Like if these are the unicorns in their things and they're doing, you know, 20 million, 50 million copies of something, but then if everybody else is down at like 500,000 copies, right? You kind of got to be like, you know, like how do you justify that I'm going to sell, you know, 50 million copies or even 25 million copies, you know, when everybody else is at 500,000, right? And so there is some genres that are kind of like that, where there's just one, as we, we joke about, 900-pound gorilla, right? There's one big, massive game in the industry that, that sometimes, like Pokemon Go, completely and totally dominates a genre, right? And, and then, you know, anybody else that's tried to compete against that particular game has failed. And so we need to understand that and, and build a business model for this. And so... so part of this brainstorming process now is how do I justify the sales? So what you might do it now, this is where it gets, um, this is where it gets tricky. Um, the, um, whoops, don't want images here. I want all. And, um, so, so some of these are where you have to kind of go into, you know, these things and, and you can look at, you know, stuff. Now, these these can be, you know, the, the, the top rated, but this doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be the top sales. Um, so, for example, um, so what I might start doing is a lot of Google searches, right? Um, so... So for example, here is, you know, some stuff that, that was about Rust, you know, and, you know, they're having, you know, it looks like 100,000 MAUs or DAUs, you know, it's not quite, um, it looks like MAUs because it's March 2020. So they're getting 100,000 MAUs or monthly active users, right? Um, so... You know, the, um, now Rust is the most viewed game on Twitch with 717,000 views, you know, and it made 1 million in revenue on two separate days, right? Well, yeah, that sounds great. But again, if you've got, you know, a $40 million um, game, um, um, you know, what is that going, you know, what's that mean, right? Um, now, um, so... Let me see here just really quick. Um, so I'm trying to see, sometimes the Wikipedia pages will, will talk about um, number of downloads, number of sales. Now, this is two things that are related, right? There's the number of users, there's the number of paying players, you know, the number of downloads and like how much money it's made. And there's some correlation to that, um, but you do have to kind of be looking at all those things to sort of know like, well, what what's the popularity, right, of that game? What's the popularity of that thing going to be? Um, and so a lot of times on the internet, we may or may not find those those things. So, so here, um, if you guys can see this, so in the first two weeks of Rust Alpha release, it sold 150,000 copies. Um, it's a little bit off screen here. Um, okay, so Rust sales has hit um, 1 million copies after being an early access tile for two months. Um, you know, making over $30 million. Um, so they had 3 million copies were sold by then. 
um, 5.2 million copies. Um, so they're at 9 million copies, making $142 million. So perfect, right? This is great information, right? Now, um, so so this is the kind of stuff where, um, and also, I, just as a quick aside, because I just saw it here, the Metacritic score of knowing how good something is also to me is an important correlation to the sales. And so it's important to kind of, to try to correlate, you know, how much money does this thing make as well as how good is it? How many people are playing it? You know, there's a lot of factors there that go into that you can try to kind of figure out like how good is this thing right now? But just because rust again is, is a good example um, of this. Now, again, you know, when I was talking about my, my back of the napkin kind of things and I was saying, you know, we spent $50 million with development and marketing. So, you know, if that was true, you know, and, and we made $142 million, we're at like almost a hundred million dollars profit and they're probably still going, right? Um, that's great. You know, and for most publishers and most people, you know, that, that's a, a significant amount of revenue and, and the, you know, that's pretty good, right? So you're three Xing your, your development costs, you know, and, and they've done, you know, very well for themselves there. Um, so, so their total sales, you know, is done, is done good right now. Um, but they could be a unicorn, right? They could be a, an outlier. And so this is where I want to have, you know, when I'm building out my ideas, I want to, for myself, know that maybe there's like five or 10 games that have done kind of in the same general ballpark like before i'm really confident to, to sort of even go like yeah that's that's probably a pretty good game right and that, that's probably a pretty good genre that we can that we can do things and then even then when i try to put together my rough figures i'll try to even do more conservative stuff so let's just say that we found 10 games that were all making over 100 million dollars right then you know i would sort of guess that like Look, even if, you know, even if we were okay, like maybe we make 75 million, right? So we've got a, we've got a high chance of making 75 million or a, a pretty good chance of making 75 million, an okay chance of making 100, you know, decent chance of making 150, right? You know, and think of it that way. Um, but don't necessarily just be arrogant and think like, well, I can, I can make a better rust. And so therefore, you know, uh, I know we can make $300 million, right? When you do that kind of math, you know, the publishers and, and the people that are going to invest in you aren't, you know, aren't going to necessarily believe you, right? So it's better to be a lot more conservative, you know, and again, if I found the top 10 games each sold over 5 million copies, you know, I would probably say like, okay, well, you know, I would try to shoot for 2 million copies or, or something like that and make sure that my break even, you know, is like at 1 million, you know, and at 2 million, I do pretty good. Um, and then, you know, and knowing that, you know, then I have a pretty good chance of getting to five, but if I don't use that as my baseline, then I'm, I'm okay. So, um, so I hope that kind of makes sense to you guys that, that at some point we have to temper our ideas. We have to, we have to prove these ideas are here and not that we need to deep dive into this too much now, but I think it is important that when we choose a genre, when we choose the style of game that we're going to make, right? Um, that we need to know that that particular audience and group is big enough to support it. And I can't even tell you how many times that, that we, we went and looked at you no know, um, different games. I'll, I'll show an example here. And I don't know what the final, um, So I'm going to use this as an example. Let's see if they if they tell us what the um, so this was a game that I helped out on, and um, and one of our problems was that I'm trying to see if they. Um, You know, if we had trouble, you know, Jordan called out as a difficult development. That was an understatement, you know, about all the, the problems we had with this um, project. Um, and, um, but what I'm looking for are the, to seeing if there was sales numbers here. 
um, just because it was one I was familiar with, um, as being something that was, let's see here. I'm scanning this to kind of see. So I don't see the, the exact sales numbers here. Um, my, my point was is that the, this particular game had a very high budget um, and a big team and you know everything else. And we got some distance into the development of it and somebody did the P&L basically at that point and basically said, you know, what can a flight shooter game make? How much money you know, are we going to make off of this game? And literally, um, I don't remember who did the, the box art um, for that. So I don't know if it says um, who did it here or not. But anyways, I don't want to get too sidetracked. Um, anyways, the, um, the, the point of this was is that we got like, one of the reasons our development got so messed up was we got... I don't know, 20% or so into our development. We were we were targeted to spend a lot of money. We had already spent a pretty good amount of money. And then somebody, you know, in kind of the sales marketing and, and forecasting thing kind of came back and went, hey guys, this game's, you know, the, the genre, you know, these action flight games, which was basically what this game was, um, was was only going to sell like, like this amount, right? I mean, and it wasn't even wasn't even 10%. I would say it's about 5% of what our budget was scheduled to be just for our development, not even not even counting sales and marketing and everything else, right? So suddenly now, you know, our projected revenue and sales was so low that like everybody freaked out, right? Because, and, and, and to good point, like why were we spending this huge amount of money on a game in a genre that was unproven and there had never been any big successes, you know, at this point in that genre that had sold incredibly well. And that doesn't mean you can't make a game in that genre, you know, and make it successful. But you've got to balance your budget with what the realistic outcome is going to be for your game. And so I want you guys to kind of see that the, that the creative and the business when you're doing ideation, at some point have to kind of align a little bit, right? And we have to kind of stop ourselves and, and, and kind of question um, not just the can we do it, but should we do it, right? The should we do it is like, like can we make money on this thing and can we prove it? Because we don't want to just have like a, a blanket like, yeah, sure, we can make lots of money on this. Like build it and they will buy it, right? Like, no, it doesn't really honestly work that way. You know, you do kind of need to see that, that the um, – that the the games you know need to have you need to have some ability to sort of know you know if that game is going to really truly make money or not right and so this was just an example from my history that haunted me for something that I was then told to go in and, and fix and change um, another game example of this was the game um, Mercenaries and where is my box here for Mercenaries it's up there well here was the the, the box, for those of you who haven't seen the, let's see, ah, for Crimson Skies, you know, that was what we were just talking about. And then the, um, oh, where's my, oh, there it is. So for those of you that aren't familiar with this game, Mercenaries, um, this was a game that I was the original kind of creative director on and very similar problem. So this game was originally, if you guys remember, Strike, the, um, Soviet Strike, Nuclear Strike. These, let's let's look at these really quick. Um, these are very old school games, um, and um, these are like you know even back to the Genesis, I believe, and you know, and stuff like this. This was kind of I think one of the later ones. On the um, on the PlayStation, the original PlayStation, and the the point of this was is that we at EA started down. We this was a franchise that we owned, um, right? And um, thanks, Tony. I'm glad you glad you like Mercenaries. Um, so this was a franchise that we start off, you know, that we that we owned, you know, and so I was told go make a spiritual successor to strike, you know, to the strike series. Right. 
And so, so we started off just making a helicopter game. It was just a pure flight combat. Oh, sorry. This video quality is atrocious. Um, okay. That was not, um, let me skip ahead here and, Oh, that's a different game, I think. All right. It doesn't really matter. Um, so it, it was basically a top-down helicopter shooter, you know, where you flew a helicopter around, you know, and you just blew stuff up, right? And almost um, a similar to Choplifter, if you guys remember Choplifter, which I actually worked on one of the Choplifter games, as well, not the original Atari one, but the, the remake. And um, similar kind of idea that you basically are flying a helicopter around and shooting things. And that was the extent of the game. And so we went to just make literally that this kind of exact same thing, but next generation, like it was going to definitely be a lot better, but it was just, you fly a helicopter, you go around and, and blow things up. And that was what we started um, making. You know, and we spent like eight months on that, you know, and then, very similar thing. Somebody at EA, you know, came back and was like, why are we making this like helicopter flying game? Like, you know, yes, it, it was a decently successful franchise in the past. Um, it's okay, but like they didn't feel that it would sell again and they didn't feel it would do very good. And so we already invested again a, a lot of money on it, you know, and, and, you know, in time and built a lot of technology. Um, and we were building in, in conjunction with Pandemic Studios. Um, so it was a co-development between EA uh, and Pandemic. We had uh, split internal teams. Um, about 50% of, of the team was at each studio. Um, and um, so both studios were in LA and kind of close. So it, the development, the cross-development, co-development wasn't too bad. However, you know, we get in there, we're making this game. Suddenly everybody's like, that's not good enough. Like, what are you going to do? And so suddenly we're like, uh, um, let me pull up Birch. So I will just play this while I'm talking. This was the, the, um, the trailer for it. So the, um, so we were kind of told mid production, like, um, so this was right after like GTA three came out and we were told mid production, like, you got to change your idea. You got to make a different game, you know, and why don't you make an open world helicopter game where you can get in and out of the helicopters, drive vehicles, you know, and do a military GTA basically. And it was like, what the hell? Like, I mean, we're, we were already far down into our game production. We were already, you know, our technology wasn't that great um, for the time even, you know, and this is, um, and you know, early PS2, Xbox, and, you know, and stuff. And just, like, to do open world games back then was really, really, really bloody hard. And um, and we had to shift, you know. And and so this was another case of we didn't validate that we should have done it a different way. We didn't validate that our idea was big enough, good enough, and would fit our budget, you know. And then somebody came in later on and was like, what are you guys doing? You know, this idea that you have isn't the right idea, for the amount of money you're spending and everything else there. And so I'm, I'm kind of rubbing this in a little bit, but, but these are very expensive, very hard mistakes that I've been caught in, not to my detriment, right, of there, but, but just nobody, um, nobody asked the question of should we build it, right? We just were told to build it. And, and so we came up with ideas. We had the best thing we could at the time, but then we got put on some really hard roads. The same with Crimson Skies. We were told basically go build kind of this type of a game in Crimson Skies. Like go build an open world Crimson Skies game. You know, it had to be a lot more than just flying around in an airplane and shooting people and things. And so so we had to revalidate our ideas based on um, the economics, the budgets, the sales forecasts, you know, and things like that. So, so ultimately... Our, our ideas had to be validated through sales, right? And so I know I'm, I'm spending a long time on this and we only have a few more minutes. So I, didn't, I figured this was kind of a, 
a good place to, to sort of end things. Um, but you know, the, you know, God, has it really been 15 years since we, we worked on that? <laughs> it's, <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, yeah. So ultimately, long story short, someday I can tell the whole story. We, we ended up splitting the production pandemic uh, went its way. Um, EA went its way after the game was kind of fairly far in production. Um, pandemic then republished it with LucasArts under, and, and it became out as mercenaries, but it's, you know, 80 percent ish, whatever I, that I designed, you know, with some new additions and some new changes, but, um, but, you know, and then internally at EA, we, we kept on a path and I spent another year at EA trying to build our own version of the game, which another long story didn't come out, you know, and, but, um, but we made some progress and we, you know, we did well with it, but it was, it was kind of one of those things where, you know, it had, it had a lot of trouble and all this came back to us not validating that our ideas were going to be financially feasible with people. Right. And so I just want you guys to understand that at some point we have to, we have to, um, understand things like that, you know, and even just saying like, um, let's see. Wow. Cannot talk. Um, so the, this part of the, 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 the search, um, you know, can be challenging, right? And I'm not sure, um, um, it's probably game, um, and you kind of have to just kind of go through, you know, but this is Resident Evil horror games, um, you know, and so it's, it can be really challenging to try to, to figure out, you know, what the best games are. Um, here's a good one for Subnautica. You know, Subnautica is a survival game, you know, and that's done 5 million, right? So, so you know, here are some great um, examples of, okay, Subnautica did 5.2 million. So that's, that's um, you know, uh, a really substantial, you know, um, number. So with each of your top games, you know, you have to kind of do some research and it's some legwork and it's boring and it sucks. But again, you want to validate, um, that, that those ideas were good. Right. Um, so real quick, Jonathan had a question. Sorry, I missed it. Um, um, would you say try to make, uh, try making games that you would enjoy making, but it's also within the realm of what's popular in that era. Yes. So, so ultimately you, you have to find this balance as a game designer of, like, what do you like? What do you want to make? Because you're, the, the more passionate you are about the idea, the better it could be. But you also have to detach yourself and kind of go like, well, there's what I like. And then, and then and what's the, what are the people today like? And then how do I even forecast that out a little bit? Like, you know, in the two years or whatever it's going to take me to make it. Is that still even going to be relevant two years from now, right? Am I making something now that can even be competitive? You know, and how can that be competitive um, you know, and you have to be careful because one of the problems that in some games where you get into, and this was a case like that I've gone into multiple times building MMORPGs, for example, where, um, these games that are heavily live operations produced, you know, I might make uh, a game. So I might see what World of Warcraft is today. Right. And, and I know that my game is going to take me two, maybe three years to get out. So I start building to a competitive product where wow is right now. And then knowing that when I'm going to ship, you know, I'm going to be as good in my mind as WoW is today. The problem is WoW has now, not only has a massive amount of production, but now it's going to have even two or three more years of production. So by the time I come out, the market may shift again because WoW suddenly just released like three more expansion packs, you know, and just went in a whole nother direction. And my target was here and WoW just went way over here, you know, and the market shifted, right? So, so you have to be, cognizant of that you have to be careful of that and kind of understand that the the, the market you know is where it is today um uh, but your competitors may shift and you know and things may ebb and flow and that's why my game schedules are so hard 
to to keep on because if you're if you're especially talking about like a, let's just say a two year average typical production cycle, um, you know what's going to change in that time period um, if it's esports or whatever, right? Like you know, can the market shift? Mobile market shifts constantly. You know, and and how are you going to adjust to that market? How are you going to adjust to that? You know, over time is a is a big challenge, right? And so so that's just something to sort of be aware of. It's something that you want to 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 know. Like, you know, is that something that's that's good, right? Is that something that you want to 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 really play? Um, you know, now and you know and then, right? And that's that's one of the hardest things to try to to do. Anyways, sorry if we got a little bit off track. I know that the brainstorming was a lot of fun. Um, we will continue brainstorming next week, but I want us to to I want you to have an understanding that that we before we go too far down a rabbit hole, we, we got to ask ourselves, should we do something right? And and I don't expect us in this particular user case to to answer all those questions, but I wanted you guys to see in my head where I start thinking very 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 early about like. You know, how can it be built? You know, should it be built? You know, and what does it need to do? Because because ultimately, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that niche markets are okay. I don't I don't mind building a game for a niche market, right? But if I know that, that this market is, say, only at max, like, capable of one or two million copies, then if my break-even is one million, you know, copies, meaning a $20 million or something budget, that's not very feasible, Right, that's that's really high risk, and so therefore, what I'll do is look at something and go like, well, maybe I should make a game for half that price so that it, it, it reduces some of that tension. So I'll scope and scale my idea down to make sure that it's more feasible. Anyways, that's it for today. Thank you so much, everybody, for for contributing today. Um, you know, all of you guys, Tony, Jonathan, Big Glob, you know. Um, all of you guys that, that contributed so much today, um, you know, um, huge, huge, huge efforts, you know, from all of you guys. Um, it's probably the best conversation I think that we've had, you know, as a, as a group, you know, throughout everything. So again, um, thanks again, everybody for spending your time with me today. I hope you started to learn a little something, but again, this is, this is a, uh, this is going to be something we're going to spend maybe some months on. I, I, I you know, cause you, you figure, you know, two hours today, eight hours a month, like that's a day of work, right? Like that's, that's nothing in, you know, when I could spend weeks and months designing a game, right? So, so keep that in mind that this is going to be a process, right? But I, but I want you guys to learn and I want you to, to see as we're doing things. I don't want this just to be me dictating to you guys. So I do appreciate all of your feedback and help and come next week with more ideas, right? And let's keep building this together and let me show you the method to the madness you know, and let's let's see how this thing starts coming together more and more. This ideation phase is a little bit trickier, um, but once we kind of get through that, things are going to roll a little bit more, and we're going to really see how to build it, right? So, thanks again, everybody. Have a great week. You know, be safe again out there, and um, in all ways, shapes, or forms. And I'm going to go hunker down in the storm and hope that I don't lose power and everything else the next tonight because it's supposed to be a doozy. So my hometown even got evacuated this morning. So it's supposed to be quite the quite the storm hitting us today in the Bay Area. So um, we'll see how that how that happens. So good luck, everybody. Take care and thanks again. And we will see you all next week. Have a great one.